Anyway, I would like to s uh, tell you a bit about our organization, our work, what we do, how we do, uh, about our different uh, tree beekeeping, let's say, maybe styles or, or, or tradition uh, as well. Uh, so I will be telling you about the things we do in Poland and in Belarus. Uh, if there will be any questions, please be free to, to ask or just notice it and uh, ask at the end. But you can as well interrupt me, it's a small group so it won't be an uh, issue. So, as I mentioned you yesterday, our motto is Natura Tradicia Historia. So I think it's uh, international and uh, easy to uh, uh, translate to any other language. Uh, we use the Latin motto as well, it's almost the same. Uh, and we think that in these three simple words, the essence of tree beekeeping is, uh, is close. So the acting for the environment and for the uh, restoring habitat uh, uh, places for habitats for the uh, bee, yes, and uh, treating the bee as a uh, white animal, not as a farming an animal, which is a, a really difference in approach to uh, to the bees. Uh, tradition, so uh, continue, uh, continuous, uh, continue the tradition of our ancestors of living in line with uh, nature law. When people try to adopt to nature, not trying to adopt the nature to themselves. Uh, this place shows that it's possible, uh, even in different aspects like agriculture or just simple living. And history. So, f uh, tree beekeeping was the f uh, one of the first professions of uh, uh, people that came to live in the uh, uh, white forests of uh, Central uh, Europe. So, as soon as they start to make the uh, uh, settlements for uh, for generations, they start to do the uh, tree beekeeping as well as a part of usement of the forest. <coughs> Our organization Fratrum Melisidarum or Bratstwo Bartle in Polish uh, have few goals, like uh, like in the motto, we want to promote the tree beekeeping not only as a part, let's say, of a, a very uh, orthodox way of natural beekeeping but as well as a way of life, as a hobby that could be a, a good occasion for interaction with the wild nature for people that, uh, uh, that do not have this kind of contact with nature on, on their daily uh, basis. Uh, so if we make the, the courses like, like this or like we do in Poland, uh, we hope that the logs we pr prepare uh, with the participants will be hung on the tree. Uh, we'll make this uh, value added for the for the environment. Uh, so uh, that's that's what we do. Yeah, we promote tree beekeeping as part of intangible cultural heritage. In 2016, we managed to acknowledge uh, tree beekeeping as part of Polish tradition and assign tree beekeeping on a national intangible heritage list. The same we helped to do for our Belarusian friends uh, last year in 2017, so two years ago. And now we prepared and submit a common application uh, signed by Polish and, and Belarus government uh, to recognize tree beekeeping as part of World Intangible Heritage uh, list of, of UNESCO. Uh, I already mentioned Belgians have some good uh, success on the assigning really strange traditions like bill culture, culture <laughs> was assigned by Belgium for example. Uh, anyway, if we succeed that will be the first uh, uh, international application that po Poland will be part of and Bel Belarus will be part of and the second uh, 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 second application that Poland as a country submitted, so we have only one uh, um, tradition that is recognized as a world uh, uh, heritage, world intangible heritage. So we'll see in October we should have uh, results. Uh, uh, about the area, why we do it with Belarus and why we do it with, with Ukrainians, why we do it like this. Uh, for ages, actually starting from 13, no, 14th century, 
uh, we had uh, one not maybe a country but a commonwealth with the grand use of Lithuania uh, that was in the end of 14th century when the uh, Polish uh, king has no son, he has just a daughter and the nobles uh, assigned it to marry the uh, Duke of Lithuania and they start a uh, Jagiellon dynasty which ruling uh, the Poland and the Grand Duke of Lithuania for 200 years and after that uh, f uh, the, 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 the unions was changed from personal union so having two countries and one king for real union so having one king, one parliament, one country organizations uh, like this with some of course uh, 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 let's say autonomy of uh, kingdom of, of, of Poland and Grand Duke of Lithuania uh, <coughs> this is a treaty keeping was an important part of the economy starting from the early middle ages uh, up to in Poland actually 17th century uh, we have the f information from the 16th century that income from tree beekeeping was bigger than income from managing forests for wood and for animals, for hunting and for uh, timbers, uh, together, joined together. Because, of course, honey was more uh, value uh, than it is right now, and the wax was as well a very important part of uh, economy. Sorry? Yeah, light, light in the house, uh, and but not only for uh, uh, for skin, uh, for leather uh, treatment, for uh, stamps, for for ma many other things yeah, as well. Not only for lights. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, the organization of tree beekeeping was different. Depends from uh, from the area. Yes, in. Kingdom of Poland, there was uh, something like guilds, organizations, which was called uh, uh, Fratrum Elicidarum, so three beekeeping brotherhoods, which have their own code of laws, which were uh, codified in the in the books. Uh, each of the brotherhoods have their own rules, uh, which they followed. They were similar in some places, in some they were. Uh, slightly different but what we can actually we have four code of laws of three beekeeper brotherhoods that were preserved to new days yes to, to our times uh, I will tell you about it uh, later just uh, so of course we do it for the bees to, to have them in our hives like this What's the source of our knowledge? This is the point I want to uh, stop a bit because uh, there is not much literature about the tree beekeeping. There is some book, ethnographic sources from the end of 19th century and beginning of the 20th century and actually each other book that is that was published after let's say 50s are uh, copying the things from the previous book. So in total it's like five books in Polish, I found one in Estonian, one in Latvian, a few in German, but maybe the, the, the German's archives and the source in German language are not so uh, rec reckoned by, by us yet. Anyway, we have uh, a lot of, uh, we can find a lot of things in the constitution of Grand Duke of Lithuania. In 16th century, uh, there was a codification of all laws that were enforced in Grand Use of Lithuania. Uh, that was in 1528. And there is a whole chapter which is dedicated to the, uh, let's say, uh, uh, forest relationships. Relationships of the forest owners and forest users and who have the rights to do what and, and how. And this is very interesting uh, source uh, for us. Uh, of course, as well, the last three beekeepers and their families from Poland, Belarus, Ukraine and Lithuania. Actually, in Poland, that was just five families that preserved some sort of tree beekeeping tradition. By, for example, keeping the way of uh, collecting the honey and wax by pressing the, the combs, not by uh, wheel pulling it on a wheel pull. 
three of them had some log hives from their ancestors and they knew all the history of all the background it wasn't just uh, something that was standing in the garden they knew that okay that was uh, logs which my father my grandfather took from the forest because he was obliged to by a uh, state forest authorities to take it out from from the forest uh, so such such history we managed to find in belarus actually you you go to the marshes of Polesia and you can find it by yourself and you can find in most of the villages single persons or few families that are uh, still doing the tree beekeeping uh, it's not so f uh, remote there uh, fortunately but uh, as you can see from the book, which, uh, which I bring as well. Uh, but unfortunately, most of those are elderly people. So uh, they have families, but uh, uh, Belarus is facing a, a, a depopulation process of the remote areas. There is no work on the villages. There is no work you know, in the cohorts. They still have uh, uh, all farming land owned by government. So you have, can you can just have the piece of land for, for your house and that's it, yes? The rest is run by the state farm, let's say, where you can have a really shitty job or you can migrate to, to town, to Minsk or to Moscow, unfortunately, because like, they have some sort of union and they invite and giving passports to all Belarusians that go to, uh, to Russia to have more citizens than to protect <laughs> if something happens. <laughs> like the, the, the things we know from Crimea, from Abkhazia and other things. Anyway, the, there's four uh, documents, uh, three beekeepers code of law that survived to our time. Uh, the one, the two which uh, preserved in the original form is the Chuhuf code of law from 78, uh, 28 and the Lemborg uh, code of law Honisa, yeah, it's from his re region. The original is in the archive. Yeah, uh, the the original is in the archive in Szczecin, and it's uh, written in German and in Polish. Uh, this is the Pomerania region, and it's like uh, it's uh, bilingual uh, code of law. They, uh, what can we learn from it? After all, after the codification of law, there is a tax uh, income. So each name, how many hives they have, how many each year, how many uh, tax they pay in in honey and in wax from uh, from the three hives they they operate. Uh, we uh, by st studying the uh, those code of law, uh, we can see. Uh, the difference between the original uh, beekeepers, I mean, between beekeepers and tree beekeeping. For example, the sorning was something uh, that was uh, very good for tree beekeepers. So it was even forbidden to protect your bees from sorning. Uh, because if you protect your bees from sorning, you are acting against the community. Other people are making around the tree hives. Uh, so you acting against them if you protect your bees from sorning because the hives will be not set. Uh, and it was seen as uh, acting against the God will of... Uh, of reproduction. Yeah, of... Uh, not of reproduction, but uh, it was like uh, the bees had to sorn because the gods <laughs> make them to, to, to sorn, so you shouldn't protect it. So any action that was limiting, uh, that was uh, faced for limiting sorning was, was prohibited by law and uh, penalty, uh, penalty was quite high for that. Uh, even the honey harvest was set for the particular time of, of the year and the uh, uh, captain of the Tribune Brotherhood was marking the data after which uh, there was, uh, it was set usually for uh, after 8th of uh, September or after 14th of September. And before, if someone was catch, uh, caught in the forest with the, with the honey, he was treated as a theft and hung it on the tree. Uh, if, uh, uh, even if he <laughs> collecting his own honey, because uh, who knows? He has honey and he shouldn't. 
uh, on that, that time. That was dedicated so all people that are able to do the tree beekeeping are uh, uh, overwork with the, their own hives so they will not steal from others. And then it's easier to protect the forest uh, like this. Uh, uh, yeah, the, uh, what, what I mentioned, he was uh, that was a death penalty for uh, stealing the honey or just collecting your own honey on the different time uh, which was dedicated for that. Uh, so the guilds had the right to uh, to give such uh, penalties uh, as well as among the uh, f members, let's say, uh, which is not. Uh, uh, it, it wasn't popular, like the blacksmith guilds di didn't give the death penalty for the blacksmith who was uh, doing the shitty stuff, yes? They, he was just, read, they read him from the guilds and giving uh, the right to make the, the profession from him and that was the biggest penalty or some fines. And the three big keepers had the, the right to, uh, to give the death penalty. What's interesting, uh, even the women were allowed to becoming uh, part of the brotherhood, but only in two conditions. Either if it was a daughter and the, the father dies and there was no son, either the wife after three beekeeper who died, uh, she get the law, law to run the three hives and operating the uh, three hives. And as well, the comparison with the guilds of blacksmiths, uh, the wife of blacksmith after blacksmith died, didn't become a part of the guild, but a guy who married the widow after the blacksmith was taken as a part of the guild. Even if he had no idea about the profession, just <laughs> just because just because he married well, he was taken uh, as a part. <laughs> Profit? Uh, no, no, the profit. Yeah, some of the uh, profit was uh, given to the captain of the guild, some to the, uh, uh, let's say, function members, like uh, uh, the guy who write everything in the book, or the, the court of justice. Uh, and the rest, uh, the biggest amount was given to the uh, administration of the king. So to. Uh, no, they, they did. They did. They were like, from the peasants, among peasants, they were considered as a very wealthy one and uh, with good uh, uh, position, let's say, social position. And what's also important and interesting, starting from Middle Ages, all uh, groups of society were able to become a tree beekeeper. So it doesn't matter if you live in the forest or you are a um, town's uh, citizen or you are a noble, uh, you were f able to to get to the guild, yes? Uh, f which is like most of the profession that time was, uh, let's say, uh, limited to the certain group of uh, of people, either to towns, like uh, towns people, or to the nobles, or to yeah. the to the peasants. Uh, in tree keeping, it was like uh, scope of of whole uh, society uh, uh, that time. Then we have a status of Grand Duke of Lithuania, uh, written in Ruski language. It's Ru Ruski is not Russian. Ruski is like old language of Grand Duke of Lithuania. Lithuanian says it's old Lithuanian language. Belarusian says it's old Belarusian language, and we said it's Ruski language. <laughs> <laughs> because the borders were also switched. Uh, no, Ruski not Russian. Uh, Uh, together, like it was one country, so uh, so it's it's uh, there were no border. The border actually with Lithuania appears after the First World War. So uh, before it was like a, a province, but not a province. Uh, let's say two equal members of the Union. So of course Lithuania had their own army. Lithuania had their own uh, currency, but the parliament was one. But there was different law for Grand Duke of Lithuania and different laws in force in Poland to keep the uh, f tradition. But uh, the, the nobles have the, 
uh, have the same code of arm after the union uh, and making those two countries together, the Lithuanian nobles were being adopted by the Polish noble family and the coat of arm was given to, to them because uh, uh, they get to the, let's say, Christian community quite late because it was like uh, 14th century. Up to the end of the 14th century they were uh, uh, pagans, yes? Uh, so there were no knights tradition, no, you know, no tradition of coats of arms and, and so on. Uh, that was a kind of nobilitation, but uh, uh, as well, the languages, it's a <coughs> tricky thing, because like the town speaks more mostly Jewish, yeah? Uh, uh, the nobles speak mostly Polish, even if they were like Russian, uh, not uh, local origins, so modern Belarus or, or Lithuanians, if they grow for the generation in the Grand Duce of Lithuania, they speak Polish as a like, political and cultural language. And the peasant speaks either Russian, either Ukrainian, I mean either Ukrainian, either Belarusian, either Lithuanian in the north part of, uh, actually not even on the whole area of the modern Lithuania, but just on the north part of it. Uh, anyway, in the 16th century, they codify all the law that are in force, probably because of this mess with, uh, you know, having one country but two uh, ju jurisdictional systems, yes? Uh, yeah, so, uh, so there is one chapter, uh, chapter 10, which uh, regulates the uh, forest. Uh, uh, relationships. And there is a very f nice thing which is called uh, uh, so law to, uh, law to entrance. Uh, so Fchody, the institution of Fchody is hard word in Polish but I cannot find the equivalent in English. It's, uh, I can describe it. It's a allowance, so uh, uh, possibility to enter the forest. They have the right. The, the right to enter the forest, yeah, it's hard. But uh, this right was something that you can get from the land owner, so from the duke, uh, or later from nobles, but mostly from the duke. It was given, uh, uh, it was given for the uh, brave uh, knights that were serving the, the duke, uh, but it was just the right to go to the forest and start the tree hives. Uh, the one who had the right for that couldn't make the uh, settlement in the forest. He could make only the temporary settlement for time of the year of working with the, with the, with, with the hives, yes. No, and making the logs and uh, making the tree hives and so on. And after like 100 years, 200 years, the land was give, g given away to the church communities, to, to some, some nobles. Uh, they were sold by the duke. But the right to uh, run the tree hives on this territory was still in force. So this right wasn't uh, ownership of the land but it as well limited the right of the owner of the land uh, further. So, and in the status is all regulated. So if someone have a uh, right to enter the forest uh, for tree, tree beekeeping purpose, uh, he cannot uh, have any weapons for hunting with him, just a uh, tree beekeeping tools which is mentioned here. Uh, he cannot collect any wood, uh, expect the amount that he can bury on his back, so no horse, no you know trolleys, just what you can have on your back. You cannot set, uh, make the uh, settlement for the whole year, uh, just temporary houses for the for the season. But you can make sauna, which is as well mentioned uh, on it, and you can collect as much wood you need for for banya, for, for, for sauna, which is very nice. If you uh, mark the tree for the tree height, the owner of the land has no right to cut the tree down. Uh, and it's enough that you put your sign on the tree. Uh, after you put the sign, like this, you have three years 
to finish the three hives inside. After three years, if you put the sign and during three years nothing happens, the owner of the land can cut, cut down the tree. Uh, if the tree broke by itself, uh, the tree beekeeper, the uh, owner of the rice, can cut the piece with the, with the cavity and take it away from the forest. Uh, and the rest of the wood is owned by, by the uh, forest owner. Yeah. Uh, what else? Interesting. Yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty much, uh, I think. So, it was functioned like this, uh, and it was okay, as long as wood was not actually a trade uh, item. Yeah. Uh, when in 19th century uh, the participants of Poland, because at the beginning of, at the end of 18th century, Polish territory was divided for Austria, Prussia, and Russia, uh, but all uh, local laws were enforced enforced uh, on that territories at the beginning, of course. Then the Russification, the Germanization. Uh, move forward uh, with the developing of the nationalism in uh, all countries, like uh, the second half of the 19th century, yes. Uh, anyway, up to this law, this code of law was enforced on the territory of Grand Dukes Lithuania, taken by the Russians, up to 1930. Uh, only then it was uh, unified with the Russian law. Uh, but this structure of ownership, you know, of a uh, law to entry uh, was a uh, problem with implementing the modern way of forest management. Mm -hmm. So you plant the forest, you cut it, you plant it again. And it says about 17,000 tree hives on the area of, let's say, 100,000 feet, 150,000 hectares. So it was 17,000 three hives on this area. You can imagine that planning the forest management with such such things is like it's I impossible. So actually the foresters were, was the one which uh, rid of the f uh, tree beekeeping from, uh, from forest and uh, now they, they are not mentioned that but uh, now they're trying to implement it back as I uh, know part of uh, uh, f uh, ecological activities and you know making a good PR uh, that they make something else than having money from from wood they, they chop down uh, f uh, so so yeah and that was the the end of uh, tree beekeeping the longest part uh, where tree beekeeping survive in this let's say primal uh, way with the trees with hives yeah uh, was Belavieja forest uh, the tree beekeepers were uh, removed from Biela Vieja forest in 1888, so uh, not more than 140 years ago, and there there is still 120 trees with the cavities because the forest is unmanaged for the last 100 years. There you can find 120 trees like this. The dead pine trees with the sign of uh, uh, tree hives, with the tree hive itself, with the tree hive that was started and unfinished because it was forbidden later. Some of them have the side desk, hung it on the hook from 140 years and it's hung it like on the, on the wooden hook there. Uh, we managed to, to find as our organization the last log hive on the tree in Augusto Forest. It was put it on the tree in four, 1949 uh, by some local local guy and uh, it was rotten but we are during one workshop we we put back on the certain the same place our log hives and we 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 manage it uh, yeah the, the last three big keeps and the families I, I mentioned that we take the source of information from them and a short uh, forms and evolution of three big keeping uh, first, it was searching for the uh, wild nests and adapting the wild nests for, manage, for managing it. It's the, the simplest one. Then the people start to, to make the, uh, the tree hives. Uh, regarding the height where the tree hives is located, it's actually different 
we uh, uh, take the uh, let's say line of four meters so we try to put everything above four meters uh, which is like each of the tree in Bielowieża forest is above four meters but some of them are 17 meters above the ground for example still below the crown of the tree but 70 meters above uh, above the ground uh, in uh, Baltic area for example they are they are uh, tree hives uh, two meters above the ground one and a half meters so just like you can reach no two meters two two and a half you can reach with your hand but uh, it's it depends from the from the territory if there was no like stealing the people feel safe among each others for sure they make it uh, lower more accessible. Uh, if, uh, if there was a uh, uh, more more remote place let's say and uh, uh, other uh, forest users or people where uh, they put it higher then we have a platforms sort of uh, platforms we we do in uh, Naliboki forest uh, the log hives on the tree and the, the hives the log hives on on the ground yes but the log hives on the ground and the tree hives like was the two forms that were uh, uh, pre present for the centuries, yes? Actually, the, uh, those, you cannot say that, okay, for this time you have just the uh, tree hives, then people start making log hives, that was all mixture, yeah? The tree hive fall down, tree hive uh, fall down, then they cut the, the log hive from it and, uh, and operate as, uh, as it, yeah? So, the feral colonies in, uh, in the trees, in the wild nest, uh, this one is from Augusto Forest, close to, to our place. Uh, the living tree hives, the hives in the living tree, uh, done by purpose and uh, for the bees. Uh, here's the, the next one of mine. Platforms from, uh, it's from Naliboki Forest. Uh, we have five five platforms like this. No, six. We make the, the last one in April with the, with the thermals. <coughs> and the lock height itself. Uh, so, regarding and uh, tree hives and lock height. The tree hives in the pine tree on the back, but it's not visible from, from here. And this is pros. The, sprouse, the problem with the pros is it's cracking when it's drying. I have one uh, sprouse log hives and it's like totally cracked in the middle from both, both sides. And the ground log hives, very popular form in, uh, in Belarus uh, and Ukraine as a, let's say, uh, garden beekeeping. Uh, anyway, on the step, do you have any questions for... No. no. Let's go forward then. <laughs> I, have some, I have some interesting information for you, mm -hmm. if you would like. Uh, there's been some documents found about uh, beekeeping in Belgium and Holland. Mm -hmm. And it was recently found that apparently uh, if you have a farming family, people who actually manage the bees for the children and children alone, it was just their job. Ah, uh, just for the kids, ah. Uh. Mm -hmm. Skeppy bee keeping that they did, and they actually found in documents that they managed over a thousand hives per family. Oh. Children. But then, you know, the managing scap hives in the past was like putting the scap hives to catch the sword, and then actually uh, kill the family at the end of the year, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they actually, it was, yeah, described as being one of the children's jobs. Mm -hmm. They did the bees and the honey, but they did, yeah, over a thousand times. That was their job. Nice. Uh, yeah, we've, uh, about our activities, we, we do the workshop, like we do here. We do the workshop in Belarus and in, in Poland, uh, that are two hour spots where, where we do and invite people to join. Uh, of course, you are welcome as well. This next will be in September, the last two weekends of September uh, uh, would be our workshop first in Belarus and then in, uh, in Poland. We are organizing the Tree Keeping Festival together with the Upper Forestry of Augusto. This is a competition of log making. 
lock hive making. The locks are cutted, pre-cutted before, quite deep and quite quite well. So there is three hours of time to finish the lock to make the covering desk three hours for two people. Uh, for two people steam. Uh, place uh, and fit the covering desk, make the side entrance, clear the uh, the hollow inside and uh, the dip it uh, a bit. Uh, the lock hives are uh, chosen by random, so you first uh, uh, randomly choose your, your lock hive which will be working. Uh, and I must say that the, the level of the participants are higher year by year. Uh, two years ago, three years ago, about half of the locks in this time was finished, like finished, yes? And last year whole ten locks were finished, like you can take it and put it on the on the tree, so so that was really really nice. Uh, but of course it has to be fun. It's not uh it's not we say a uh, uh, chase for the golden carrot. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so, so it has to be fun. Uh, each team gets the the tools they work with, so they can take it uh, home, uh, and it's quite, quite, quite good. It take place. It took place at 13th of July this year. So, actually, in two weeks, if you have time, you're welcome to to join us. And there is a lazy contest. <laughs> <laughs> Legivo climbing competition as well. Uh, yeah, then we score the locks. Yeah, okay. Score the smoothness inside. How the things fit. If there is, a, you know, uh, if the desk is fit well, or there's, you know, f yeah. holes like uh, like this. How the side entrance is being made. And unfortunately, to score it well, each of them have to be the do the same pattern. So. So one uh, one way. Uh, yeah, the festival is quite. It's not big, but uh, it's okay. So if you really love, you can. Yeah, it's it's on the lake. Uh, we have nine lakes on the territory of the town. So uh, we uh, as well. Si the height of the lock. They are quite big ones. It's 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 hard to put them on the trees. That's yeah. true. Yeah. <laughs> that's true. Uh, I was speaking with the, the foresters. Choose the trees for that, and I I was speaking a few times with them. It doesn't have to be such big. It doesn't have to be. Oh, but we have such wood. So. Is it always pine? It's always pine. Like uh, Augusto Forest, uh, which have like 100,000 hectares, it's 85% of the pine woods. So mm -hmm. we have pine woods, pine forest, and, and pines everywhere. Yeah. Uh, uh, in Belarus, we have a place which uh, we call uh, uh, just Hutor or tree beekeeping Hutor, uh, uh, which we renovate from the uh, money we earn as a foundation or we we made as well a crowdfunding project uh, two years ago we gathered like three thousand euro uh, we dedicate some work of of us for that few weeks and we managed to prepare some uh, some quite good conditions uh, f uh, considering the fact that we should uh, we had to make a road to that place because there were no road completely no road for one week only, we are constructing the, the the road to be able to to finish uh, uh, the preparation for the uh, for the cutter. And we we do the workshop there. Uh, uh, Thais was there, and and you were there. You know you know you know the place. We try to improve it year by year. We have the beds. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Actual, actual beds. Yeah, with, with, with the mattress, that, that also helps. <laughs> With the mattress, yeah. <laughs> With the sauna, the, the blue doors on the right, sauna. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And this is from from outside yeah, the place. Yeah. It's uh, it's really nice. Okay.
thank you for your attention. Uh, it's quite slight, so I will not bother you more with the bees. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I don't <laughs>